If you've been thinking about Study Sesh, I recently added 16 new pod quizzes covering the endocrine system and maternal newborn. And since I've added so many new lessons, this does mean the price will be going up, and it goes up on Thursday, March 16th. So this is the perfect time to get Study Sesh, which features more than 140 lessons for less than 30 cents each. Want to try Study Sesh first? Then check out episode 123 and 175 of this podcast. To learn more, go to straightanursingstudent.com and click on Courses in the top menu bar. That's straightanursingstudent.com and click on Courses in the top menu bar. See you in Study Sesh. Well, hello there. I'm Nurse Mo and welcome. This is the Straight A Nursing Podcast, where I teach nursing concepts and share tips on how to thrive in school and at the bedside. So today we are diving into a fundamental concept looking at vascular assessment. Before we do that, let's take a quick minute for a shout out to Ashley, who writes in to say this. Med Surge Solution is amazing. Concepts that I have been unsure about are becoming clearer. Thank you, Straight A Nursing, for breaking the information down in a way that I can understand. If you're heading into Med Surge, this is a must. So thanks, Ashley, for taking the time out of your busy schedule. I know nursing students are super busy, and I appreciate you submitting that feedback. And if you're wondering what Ashley is talking about, Med Surge Solution. I used to call it Beyond Boot Camp. I gave it an entirely big upgrade, huge facelift, added a ton of lessons, and it now includes 57 topics covered in about 63 or so video lessons because some topics are a little bigger and required breaking them up, but it covers 57 of the key topics from Med Surge. It's video based, and the study guides that go with it are worth their weight in gold. So I will put a link in the episode notes so you can check out Med Surge Solution. Also, if you just go to my website, straightynursingstudent.com, and click on courses in the top menu bar, you'll get there. Okay, so the vascular system, which we're talking about today with vascular assessment, is comprised of vessels that move blood and lymph throughout the body. So this includes the arteries, the arterioles, the capillaries, the venules, and the veins. Much of your vascular assessment, though, is going to be evaluating arterial function since it's the arteries that deliver oxygenated blood and nutrients and all that good stuff to the tissues. So before we dive into vascular assessment, let's review a few key terms. So one is ischemia. This may come up as part of your vascular assessment, and this means inadequate blood supply to an organ or a tissue. So that's ischemia. Hypoxia is inadequate oxygen at the tissue level. So you might hear somebody say tissue hypoxia. Okay, they're talking about the tissues not getting enough oxygen. Necrosis is the death of a tissue, which could be because of inadequate oxygen. Very good. Infarct is that area of necrosis due to that inadequate blood supply. And then brewy and thrill. A brewy is an abnormal sound heard over an area of turbulent blood flow. We'll talk about this more in a bit. And a thrill is a soft vibration felt on the skin overlying that area of turbulent blood flow, such as over an AV fistula or a significant cardiac murmur, for example. So when are vascular assessments conducted? So it's important to understand that in most cases, what you are ultimately assessing with your vascular assessment is tissue perfusion. Not always, because sometimes your vascular assessment will be looking at the venous side. But for the most part, we're really going to be concerned when there's not adequate tissue perfusion. So when you're assessing your patient's distal pulses, for example, let's say you can't find a pulse on the left foot. How well do you think that tissue is being perfused? 
probably not very good. If capillary refill is delayed, what does that tell you about tissue perfusion? So always be thinking about the tissues getting perfused, getting the oxygen that they need. And again, sometimes that assessment is going to be focused on the veins. If the patient has venous insufficiency or varicose veins or a deep vein thrombosis or things like that. But again, for the most part, when you're doing a vascular assessment, 90% of it's going to be looking at the arterial side of circulation. Now, with that said, a basic vascular assessment is conducted on every patient. When you check a blood pressure, palpate that radial pulse and check capillary refill as part of your general head-to-toe assessment. Vascular assessments are also conducted in many other clinical scenarios, including the patient has known or suspected peripheral vascular disease, so you want to dive in deeper for your patients with vascular disease. The patient has a known or suspected deep vein thrombosis, or the patient has undergone treatment or surgical treatment for an arterial issue, such as removing a blood clot or getting a thrombolytic for a blood clot. You would also be doing vascular assessments on a patient who has had any type of vascular surgery. In the recovery room where I currently work, we get a lot of patients that are having fem pop, femoral popliteal bypass surgery. We're doing a ton of vascular assessments on those patients. You'll be looking at vasculature when the patient has an AV fistula or an AV graft. Or if the patient has had an artery puncture, like with a left-sided heart cath procedure. Or simply when the patient has compromised hemodynamics, because if hemodynamics are compromised, you're going to see that decreased tissue perfusion. Okay, first let's talk a little bit about blood pressure measurement. I'm not going to tell you everything you need to know about blood pressure measurement, but I will share a few key tips. So to ensure a proper blood pressure measurement, it's really, really important that you make sure you have the appropriate sized cuff. So if the cuff is too big, this is going to give a reading that is falsely low. And if the cuff is too small, it's going to give a reading that is falsely elevated. So what you will need to do in the clinical setting is just make sure you grab the right cuff. Those disposable cuffs have markings on them. Super easy to tell if it fits your patient. But if you're a student and you're just learning about this, your school is going to make sure you know how to measure the arm and measure the cuff and choose the right cuff. So with that said, the width of the bladder should be about 40% of the arm circumference. And then the length of the bladder, so that, you know, how far up the arm that cuff goes, it should cover 80% of the arm from elbow to shoulder, okay? So 40% of the arm circumference should equal that width of the bladder or be around the width of the bladder. Okay, so with that said, one of the things I will tell you that I see so often in the clinical setting, so often, is that my patient will have the wrong size blood pressure cuff on. And usually it's a cuff that's too big. So whenever I get a patient and their blood pressure is just reading low and it doesn't make sense, I go and I look at that cuff. Either it's too big a lot of times, so they'll have a standard cuff when they're really just a tiny little thing and they could use a small cuff, or the cuff is not placed on properly so it's not secure around the arm. That would make it too big, right? or the way that it is positioned is wrong. It's not actually over any of that artery. It's flipped all the way around. So sometimes when you get a blood pressure reading that doesn't make sense, go and check your cuff. And then of course, if you're placing the cuff, you'll make sure that it is the right size and placed properly. Some more tips for accurate blood pressure measurement include, you wanna position the patient optimally, which would be seated, with the arms supported at heart level. I realize a lot of times in the clinical setting, that's not possible, patients are in bed. So if you can raise the head of the bed, great. If you can't, just make sure that you know in the chart what position the patient was in when you took the reading. Supine, semi-fowlers, seated, standing, etc. You want to ask the patient to be still 
and quiet during the reading. Moving around, talking is going to skew the reading greatly. If the reading, again, does not make sense, you want to go back and check. So what do I mean by a reading that doesn't make sense? Well, let's say your patient is talking to you, they're wide awake, and their blood pressure reads 72 over 37. Okay, that does not make sense to me. I'm going to think, hmm, I bet their cuff is not on in the right way or even on their body at all. So I'm going to go check. Or maybe their blood pressure has been trending 140s, 130s around there, and now it's 110 and we didn't do anything to intervene to bring it down. That doesn't make sense. I'm going to go check, et cetera. So you're looking at trends with that. You're also looking at the patient's clinical presentation. And then to be very thorough, you would check blood pressure on both arms, noting that a slightly higher reading on the right is not uncommon. Now let's talk a bit about assessing pulses. So pulses are assessed via palpation, meaning we're going to feel the pulse. When we can't feel it or palpate a pulse, we can then use a Doppler device to assess the pulse with sound. So a Doppler device. It's a little square box. It has a little, I don't even know what it looks like. It looks kind of like a fat Sharpie marker shaped thing. Okay. And that is what you're going to place over the artery. You'll put some conductive gel down, put that transducer, that thing that's kind of the shape of a short fat Sharpie over where you expect the artery to be and listen for the sound of blood flow. So if you cannot palpate a pulse before you go and say a pulse is absent, you also want to grab the Doppler and really, really make sure. So the most common pulses assessed in the clinical setting are the radial pulse, the dorsalis pedis, and the posterior tibial. You'll get really good at assessing these three sites. In a code or in cases where hemodynamics are severely compromised, you'll be assessing the carotids instead and the femoral artery because they're more central. They're closer to the heart, so they're more likely to have a palpable pulsation that you can feel or get via Doppler. So pulses are graded based on their strength. So zero is absent. And again, before you chart absent, you've gone and grabbed that Doppler and tried like heck to find that pulse because an absent pulse is a big deal. One is a diminished or weak pulse. Two would be normal. And then three is a bounding, very strong pulse. So if you find that it's difficult to locate your patient's pulse, either by palpation or by Doppler, and Doppler pulse assessment can be a little bit tricky sometimes, mark the location when you find it. That way, when you come back later, you know exactly where to go to get that pulse, and the next person who's taking over care of the patient can easily or more easily find that pulse. A little tip with the Doppler device, like I said, it can be a little tricky sometimes, so what you want to do is turn the sound up, okay, turn it up all the way. And you may even need to get your ear down really close to it if the patient has very, very diminished pulses. And you've got your your transducer over that area. If you're just not hearing anything, keep it in the same area, but change the angle. Just switch the angle, like shift the angle of that transducer a little bit and just go all the way around different angles. And sometimes you'll pick it up because of the angle that you're holding the transducer. So that's my Doppler tip for you. All right, let's just now talk about some general assessments of peripheral vasculature. So one of the things you'll be doing is measuring capillary refill. And you do this by compressing the nail bed until the tissue blanches. So you can do that right now if you're not driving or operating any heavy machinery. So compress the nail bed until the tissue blanches and then release. And the time that it takes for that tissue to reperfuse, for the color to return to normal, should be about three seconds or even less. In an individual where capillary refill is more than three seconds, this is considered delayed and is an abnormal finding. And this tells us that tissue perfusion is compromised. We'll also be assessing for edema, specifically pitting edema, which may be present bilaterally, 
in some conditions like venous insufficiency and unilaterally in something like a deep vein thrombosis. So to assess for pitting edema, you'll press on the area with your fingers and observe basically how deep that indentation is. Pitting edema is graded as plus one all the way up to plus four. So plus four is the most severe and it indicates that that induration is about eight millimeters. So significant indentation there. You are also assessing the color of the extremities. Abnormal color findings include pallor, which is paleness, ruber, which is redness, modeling, which is a very poor sign. It indicates really compromised hemodynamics and obviously inadequate tissue perfusion. Cyanosis, which would be an indicator of lack of oxygen to that area, and black or necrotic. And black or necrotic tissue is typically due to something called dry gangrene, which is often a result of arterial insufficiency. You will also be assessing temperature of the extremities. So when blood flow is inadequate, the extremities are often cool. And this is most easily noted in the hands and the feet. And when no blood flow is present, guess what happens? They're not just cool, they're actually cold. You want to observe for any skin abnormalities, such as lesions or ulcers, and you might be saying, why would that be part of a vascular assessment? Well, these can occur due to venous insufficiency, arterial insufficiency, and even the presence of underlying AVMs. If you'd like to dive deeper into AVMs, I want you to go and listen to episode 241. You'll also be assessing the veins for things like varicosities and other abnormalities. Varicose veins are typically pretty common in pregnant individuals and those who stand or sit for long periods of time. If the vein is pulsating, which as you probably are thinking, hey, that's not right. Veins should not pulsate. This could be an AVM. Do not palpate that. You don't want it to rupture. Make sure the MD is aware of that. With thrombophlebitis, the patient may complain of an aching pain and there will be swelling and even firmness over that affected vein. And of course, you also want to assess for pain, which may be present with both arterial and venous disorders. The pain associated with arterial disorders is more intense in general and can be relieved by rest. The pain with venous disorders is often described as a more dull, type of constant pain that the patient may describe as a feeling of heaviness in the legs. Now let's talk very briefly about neurovascular assessment. So a basic neurovascular assessment includes circulation, sensation, movement. You might hear this simply referred to as CSM. So circulation is assessed by palpating the pulse or grabbing that Doppler and by assessing capillary refill, the skin's color, and the skin's temperature. Okay, all of those things tell us about circulation. Sensation is assessed by asking the patient if they have numbness and tingling. So touch them, see if they can feel you touching them. Ask them if they have tingling or pins and needles in their hands or feet or legs or wherever you're assessing. And then movement is assessed by asking the patient to simply move the extremity. Now let's move on and talk about the six P's of ischemia. So when blood flow to an extremity is significantly reduced or even absent, the patient will experience ischemia. And the six P's of ischemia can help you recognize this abnormal clinical finding. So they are pain, pulselessness, pallor, poikilothermia, paresthesia, and paralysis. So let's talk through each of these. Pain. So the pain with ischemia can be severe and is often described as a sharp or burning pain. Pulselessness is obviously the absence of a pulse, including the inability to find the pulse via Doppler. Pallor means that the area distal to that interrupted blood flow, like let's say it's a blood clot that's causing the ischemia, the area distal to that will be pale. 
And then poikilothermia, which is a pretty cool word. It sounds made up, right? Poikilothermia is basically the inability to maintain body temperature. So that area will be cool, often cold, if it is completely occluded. Paresthesia is the patient complaining of that numbness, that pins and needles, that tingling sensation. And paralysis, obviously, is they will not be able to move the affected area. Now, I'm not saying they'll have all six, but if you see all six, this would definitely be an emergency, but keep an eye out for any of these six, which can indicate ischemia is occurring. So kind of related to ischemia is the practice of performing an Allen test. We're not going to actually cause ischemia, but we are going to purposefully disrupt blood flow temporarily. So an Allen test is conducted prior to the puncture of the radial artery. And you're thinking, when are we puncturing the radial artery? Well, we do this with arterial blood gas draws and when we place art lines or arterial lines for constant blood pressure measurement. So the test is performed to ensure that the hand has adequate blood flow through the ulnar artery, just in case we messed up that radial artery, would the patient still get adequate blood flow? So to perform the Allen test, you have the patient clench their fist, and if they can't clench it, you can close it tightly for them. You occlude both the radial and the ulnar arteries. This is going to obstruct blood flow to the hand. So you keep that pressure on there, have the patient open their hand, and you look to see if the palm and the fingers have blanched. If they haven't blanched, you're not occluding enough. You need to keep occluding, press a little harder, find a better location. You want those to blanch, okay? And then release pressure over the ulnar artery. And what you expect and want to see is that the hand flushes, that blood flow returns. The Allen test is considered positive if that hand flushes within 5 to 15 seconds. And what this indicates is that we have adequate blood flow through the ulnar artery. If the test is negative, meaning the hand did not flush within 5 to 15 seconds, this suggests that ulnar circulation, that ulnar artery, is not able to provide adequate blood flow on its own. So we're not going to mess with the radial artery. We are not going to puncture it. A great opportunity to see this test performed is if you're in the ICU or the ER and the respiratory therapist or whoever does ABGs in my facility, it's the respiratory therapist in the facility where you are working or doing clinicals. It might be the RN that's doing it. It might be the MD that's doing it, but they will be performing an Allen test before drawing that ABG. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about for vascular assessment are brewies and thrills. So a brewy is an abnormal sound that occurs over areas of turbulent blood flow. Sometimes they're expected as with an AV fistula or AV graft, but they can also be pathological and unexpected, such as with a carotid brewy. So to assess for a brewy in the carotid arteries, ask the patient to hold their breath as you listen through your stethoscope to that blood flow through the artery. The presence of a brewy in a carotid artery is suggestive of carotid stenosis, and the patient may be at risk for stroke. So you want to make sure the MD knows that Mr. Jones has a carotid brewy on the right side. Okay, now to assess for a brewy in the AV fistula or the AV graft, you're going to basically do the same thing. Place your stethoscope on the skin. The patient doesn't have to hold their breath for this one because it's peripheral, but place your stethoscope on the skin and listen for that turbulent flow. You can also feel for the turbulent flow with gentle palpation. This is called a thrill. The thrill is like a vibration under the skin. Kind of feels like, what it feels like when you touch a cat's neck who's purring, that's what a thrill feels like. If you're unable to hear the brewy or feel the thrill in a patient with an AV fistula or graft, this would be an abnormal finding and the MD should be notified. Now, there are other locations where you could listen for a brewy and you'll most likely be tested on these if you are in nursing school still. Maybe not doing this so much at the bedside, but 
it's important to know how to listen for them in case you have a high suspicion that your patient could be having a problem in these other locations. And those are the temporal arteries, the aortic artery, the renal arteries, the iliac and femoral arteries. Always have the patient hold their breath while you listen to these. It will make listening and hearing them a lot easier. All right, so there is your brief overview of vascular assessment. Let's do a few pod quiz questions to test your understanding. So a pod quiz means I'm going to ask you a question, pause for a bit, and give you time to answer. Then I'll tell you the answer. And if you like this form of review, then you need to go check out Study Sesh, which is my private podcast that includes about I want to say about 90-ish pod quizzes over all kinds of subjects in nursing school. I'll put a link to study sesh in the episode notes, or again, you can just go to my website, click on courses in the top menu bar, you'll find it. Okay, so let's go through this and do a little bit of pod quizzing. What is the medical term for inadequate blood supply to an organ or tissue? What is this called? That is ischemia. And what is inadequate oxygen at the tissue level called? That is hypoxia. Very good. What is death of tissue called? Necrosis. And what is an infarct? The infarct is the area of necrosis, and that's going to typically be to inadequate blood supply. And then which one do you feel, a brewy or a thrill? You feel the thrill. Very good. When you're looking at your blood pressure cuff measurement, the width of the bladder should be what percentage of the arm circumference? 40% of the arm circumference. A blood pressure cuff that is too large will create a falsely high or falsely low reading. A falsely low reading. What about a cuff that's too small? That would be a falsely high or falsely elevated reading. If you're palpating your patient's dorsalis pedis and you cannot find it, do you chart this as no pulse or do you do something else? You definitely do something else first. You're going to go grab the Doppler and try to auscultate that pulse with the Doppler device. Capillary refill is considered delayed if it takes longer than how many seconds? Three seconds. Very good. What does pallor mean? That means paleness. And what does ruber mean? That means redness. What do you do if you see a varicose vein that is pulsating? You definitely do not want to palpate it. Just make sure that the MD is aware of it. It could be an AVM. What is the word that means the extremity is unable to maintain body temperature? Poikilothermia. And can you remember all six P's of ischemia? Those are pain, pulselessness, pallor, poikilothermia, paresthesia, and paralysis. When you're performing an Allen test, you're looking for adequate function of which artery? 
the ulnar artery. Remember, we're making sure that the ulnar artery can supply the hand with adequate blood flow because if it couldn't, we definitely are not going to mess with the radial artery because then the patient wouldn't get any blood flow and could lose their hand. Okay, very good. So if you liked reviewing with a pod quiz and testing your knowledge, then again, go and check out Study Sesh. People use it all through nursing school. They use it to prep for NCLEX. It will change your life, get you away from your desk. It's not even like doing flashcards because with flashcards, you still have to kind of sit and look at them. This is like flashcards for your ears. It's totally awesome. And then I'd love to have you back with me again next week. We're going to be diving into a neurological disorder, Huntington's disease. So I'll see you back here for that in just a few days. If you're following the show, which I really hope you are in whatever podcast player is your favorite, then the episodes show up for you every Thursday like clockwork. And then if I do a bonus episode, it shows up as well. You don't even have to think to go look for it. So if you're not yet following the show, I'd love it if you would do that before you close out of your podcast player today. And if you're so inclined, leave a rating and a review and totally make my day. Okay, I'll see you back here next week. Bye for now. This podcast is brought to you by Straight A Nursing.